Sony A6700, Fujifilm X-S20, which one is better for video for you? Unfortunately, I had to send back the X-S20 before filming the talking head portion of this video, but rest assured, I did have the camera. So what you're seeing in this video is gonna be a comparison against the A6700 in stability, rolling shutter, autofocus, some content creator slash vlogging features that each camera is touting, battery life and overheating. And I'll give you sort of features and specs rundown because each camera has some interesting things that they do that the other one doesn't do. I rented the XS20 for a week along with the 23 millimeter F1.4. And I am by no means an expert in that camera. And the comparisons that I did in this video against the A6700 are not comprehensive. Obviously I had very limited time, so I did the best that I could. So I'm not presenting this as a definitive review of either camera. Hopefully it's just some information that you can take if you're trying to decide between these two relatively affordable, interchangeable lens APS-C cameras, one from Fujifilm, one from Sony standard state. So we're going to look at both cameras with no stability enabled so we can just see the baseline. This is what we're working with. It's a pretty bumpy stretch of asphalt and it's also downhill. I tried to be careful. I did a little bit of a ninja walk and I cradled both cameras around my midsection, but I also walked relatively quickly. Here's the A6700 with just standard IBIS. This is just the physical IBIS of the camera. Here's the Fujifilm with its standard IBIS. Here's the Sony with its active mode, and this applies an additional crop to give more room for the image to be stabilized. Here's the X-S20 with its electronic image stabilization, which does pretty much the same thing. The X-S20 has an additional mode called Boost, which I did test, but it's not really meant for moving the camera. It's essentially meant to allow you to hold the camera stationary as if it were on a tripod. Taking a look at rolling shutter, I have both cameras on the same tripod, one on top of the other, so they're being panned exactly the same way in each shot. In 4K24, you can see that the A6700 is a faster reading sensor. It has less severe rolling shutter than the X-S20. Overheating has been a hot topic ever since the A6700 was launched. And I've done some overheating tests of my own and concluded that yes, the A6700 will overheat. When you first start up both cameras and you go through the initial setup process, both will ask you if you want to leave the temperature threshold set to normal or if you want to set it to a higher threshold. I set both cameras to the higher threshold. The X-S20, when I first got it, I was actually surprised by how small it is. It's actually smaller than the A6700. So I was like, man, if the A6700 overheats, this camera is definitely gonna overheat as well. I set up both cameras in 4K24, H.265, 422 10-bit at 100 megabits per second and let them record in this room. I don't know exactly what the temperature was in here, but it felt relatively comfortable to me. So I would imagine it was around 72 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit. They both overheated. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, I apparently neglected to take note of how long the Fujifilm recorded before it overheated. I'm an idiot, so I apologize for that. The battery indicator was showing at least two, if not three bars left. The A6700 overheated at one hour and 33 minutes and at 16% battery life. So I think the Fujifilm overheated anywhere between an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes. So I, I'm sorry I cannot give you a definite number, but both cameras did overheat at 4K24, 422, 10-bit, H.265, 100 megabits per second indoors. Then I tried a G. Then I tried 4K24, H.264 compression, 428 bit, 60 megabits per second on the Sony and 50 megabits per second on the XS20, and neither camera overheated. They both ran until the battery died. The A6700 battery lasted for two hours and 10 minutes, and the X-S20's battery lasted for two hours and 34 minutes. If you wanna record in 4K24, but ensure that your cameras will not overheat, then you're gonna to have to lower the quality settings. 
I do not want to present this as a definitive autofocusing capabilities of the XS20. I believe that the 23 millimeter lens that I had rented is an older version. And from everything that I've seen from other YouTube creators, the autofocusing performance of Fujifilm cameras is very dependent or reliant on the generation of the lens. Fuji is updating its lenses and all its newer lenses have much better continuous autofocusing capabilities. So it's possible that a newer lens may have performed better on the X-S20 than the one that I had. With all that said, it still autofocuses very well, just not as well as the A6700. They both have very sophisticated algorithms for tracking autofocus for humans, for animals, and they've got ways to track different types of objects. And if you look at the back of the screen, both cameras will find a subject to track, put a little box on the eye, and follow it around very reliably. They both have options to set how quickly the camera will look for different subjects. But in every instance that I'm gonna show you, I have the camera set to lock on. So that means that once they find and identify a subject, they're not really supposed to deviate from that subject, if at all possible. This is where the Sony really separates itself from the X's 20. When it locks on a subject, it locks on a subject and does not deviate. The X-S20 is much more willing to shift between different subjects, especially if something gets closer to the frame than its initial subject. So in this test here, this is just me standing in front of the camera, walking back and forth, pretty simple, and both cameras performed flawlessly here. I've also shot an entire YouTube video with the X-S20 as my talking head camera. Outdoors, all those shots worked flawlessly. However, indoors, sitting in a very similar setup to this with that 23 millimeter lens, I'm very close to the camera, very shallow depth of field. It does lock onto my eye and stay focused, but you can see that it's sort of trying to readjust or reacquire focus or just make sure that it has focus. So if you look at that monitor, especially behind me, every once in a while you'll see that pulse in and out. That's something that will almost never happen on the A6700. With animal eye detect, again, the Fuji is very quick to identify a subject and track it, but it's much more likely to switch subjects in the middle of the shot, whereas the Sony will not deviate from its initial subject. The Sony's not flawless. There was a couple of situations where it was slow to find a subject and start tracking it. And there's also a brief section here where it looks like it's front focusing on my dog's paw as opposed to his eye. Product showcase mode. I don't know what the f Let's move on to the vlog and content creator features of these cameras. The Fujifilm actually has a vlog mode on its mode dial. I didn't spend a ton of time with these features, but I just wanted to showcase them and talk a little bit about what they're supposed to do. But I didn't really spend much time dialing in the settings, so don't take what I'm about to show you as like a definitive performance review of either of these modes. The Fujifilm, when you turn it into vlog mode, and open up the quick menu, it gives you a sort of different and more simplified setup of menu options than the normal quick mode when you're in video. And you also have a different focusing option. So instead of like eye detect and human tracking, you have a product showcase mode. So when you are in the frame, it's going to prioritize focusing on your face, on your eye. But if you have something that you hold up in front of you, it should shift focus to that. Whether or not you're blocking, yourself from the camera lens or not. It should go ahead and shift to whatever's closer to the lens. It's sort of making a lot of decisions for you and prioritizing the shallow depth of field look. And in my opinion here, it's way too shallow because as I hold this camera up to the lens, sometimes it's focusing on my fingers and on my knuckle as opposed to the camera that I'm trying to showcase. So again, you may have to spend more time than I did trying to dial in that depth of field and some of the different settings in order to get it to work, but I really wanted to show you what it's meant to do. It gives you fewer options, but it's really trying to prioritize keeping you in focus and keeping objects in focus, giving you a shallow depth of field, and giving you a kind of baked in but well exposed look right at a camera without you having to dial in the exposure triangle essentially for yourself. The content creator feature on the A6700 is an auto reframe feature where it will find a subject in the frame and track it around. So if it moves around, it will kind of crop in and follow it. So it almost looks as if you have a camera operator when you don't. There's three cropping levels. So you can have a wide, a medium, and a tight crop. What you're seeing here is the tight crop. It looks pretty convincing. So I'm moving around pretty unpredictably and if I move kind of drastically, the camera is a little bit slow to figure out where I'm going, but that's kind of how uh, I think a normal camera operator would 
operate if they couldn't exactly predict what you were going to do. But there are a few cases here where it, it lost me, didn't know where I was, it maybe got distracted by something else in the frame. So it's not perfect. Again, there are more settings that you can dial in, how responsive it is, how slow the movements are, etc. Obviously, it's cropping in a lot and it's a digital crop. So you are gonna be losing resolution and image quality. Speaking of HDMI, the XS20 can output raw video via its HDMI. So if you have an Atomos recorder, you can record ProRes RAW. If you've got a Blackmagic recorder, you can record in Blackmagic RAW. The A6700 does not output raw video via HDMI. You can use an external recorder, but you'll be limited to ProRes or DNX or some other compressed codec. Both cameras have 26 megapixel APS-C sensors that equate to about a 6K or 6.2K resolution for video. The A6700 does not allow you to film in 6K, so it's going to downsample that into 4K or do something to get down to HD. The A6700 is limited to 16 by 9 aspect ratio, so that's 4K UHD or full HD, whereas the XS20 can shoot in 16 by 9 and 4K in HD, but also DCI 4K, which is a little bit wider, so 4096 by 2160, but also 2K, which is a little bit wider for HD. It also allows you to shoot in 6.2K open gate, so it's basically reading out the entire sensor for video, which is a feature that I absolutely love and really hate that Sony refuses to allow it in any of its cameras. So definite edge to the XS20 in terms of aspect ratios and possible resolutions. The XS20 also has so many more bit rates and codec options than the Sony, way too many to cover in this video. The Sony has enough options in my opinion, but the XS20 has more options. So if you're having trouble editing any of the codecs that you're filming on in the XS20, then chances are you'll find a different codec that will work better for your system, but also give you the desired quality. Both film in all intra compression if you want, so that's going to be less compressed but bigger file sizes, and they both film in long op H.264 and H.265, which are going to be more compressed and smaller file sizes. In terms of high frame rates, the Sony can shoot in 4K24, 4K30, and 4K60 with no crop in any of those modes. The Fujifilm can shoot in 4K60, but it has a small crop to get into that resolution and frame rate. The A6700 can go up to 4K 120, but that has a heavy crop, whereas the XS20 does not have a 4K 120 mode at all. Both have additional frame rates in HD up to 240 frames per second. Going back to that 26 megapixel 6K sensor, in terms of image quality and dynamic range, you'd be hard pressed to find much of a difference between these two cameras. However, the XS20 has one really important feature to me, and that's the ability to turn down or turn off the internal noise reduction, which of course I did. So everything you're seeing in this video with the exception of the vlog mode is in F-Log2 with the internal noise reduction turned to zero and sharpening likewise turned all the way down. On the A6700, I'm filming everything in S-Log3, S-Gamut 3 Cine, and by default, the sharpening in that mode is already set to as low as it can go, but you have no control over the internal noise reduction in the A6700, regardless of which profile you're using. I like to dabble in color grading and manipulating my image in post. I'm not an expert, but it's very important for me, or it's very exciting to me, when a camera allows you to adjust those kinds of settings. The Fujifilm gets a massive gold star in that regard. I mentioned that I shoot in log formats exclusively, and one disadvantage of the XS20 is that it will not allow you to go below the base ISO in either F-Log or F-Log2. And in F-Log2, the uh, base ISO is around 1250, I think it is, so that's pretty high. So you may struggle with getting a good exposure if you're in a really bright scene with F-Log2. Sony, to its credit, allows you to go below the base ISO when you're shooting in S-Log. So which one is better? Which one should you get? It's very difficult for me to pick a winner. I like both of these cameras a lot and each one has some distinct advantages over the other, but nothing that's so earth shattering to easily sway you one way or the other. The one big advantage I think for the Fujifilm is the overall options in terms of resolutions. 
codex and quality. The biggest advantage, in my opinion, for the Sony is the autofocus. I hope that was helpful. I hope I was able to offer you some insight about these cameras if you're trying to decide between them. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave a comment. I'm always happy to help offer any more insight or information to the best of my ability. And as always, I really appreciate you watching the video and maybe I'll see you in another one. Oh.